We start today our new campaign. A campaign is something like a theme, but we think it's more than a theme because we want to bring you the Word of God that will get in you and change your life. And God's Word does it by step by step as He takes you from glory to glory. So we call it a campaign. And this new campaign we're starting is called Assignment because we also believe that every person on this earth, whether they know Almighty God or not, that you have been given in your DNA, deep in your mother's womb before you're even born, you have been given an assignment from God. You were born on purpose for a purpose. But that purpose, that assignment was not for your own ends. That was for God's glory. And so many of us go through life and we're trying to work out our way and do our stuff the best we can. But you can never, ever achieve the best for your life unless you're in step with what God has ordained you to do and be. And so that is what we're going to go through about an assignment. If you've got your Bibles with you, then let's look at chapter, sorry, um, the book of John and it's chapter 21. If you haven't got any Bibles with you, then it will be on the screens for you to read. It's quite a long passage today, but as I was thinking, why not? What better place to read the Word of God than in church? Chapter 21, and we're starting at verse one. Later, Jesus appeared again to his disciples beside the Sea of Galilee, and this is how it happened. Several of the disciples were there, Simon Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples. And Simon Peter said, I'm going fishing. We'll all come too, they said. So they went out into the boat, but they caught nothing all night. And at dawn, Jesus was standing on the beach, but the disciples couldn't see who he was. He called out, fellows, have you caught anything? No, they replied. Then he said, throw your net on the right-hand side of the boat and then you'll get some. So they did and they couldn't haul in the net because there were so many fish in it. Then the disciple that Jesus loved, which is John, by the way, said to Peter, it's the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his tunic for he had stripped for work and he jumped into the water and he headed to shore. The others stayed in the boat and pulled the loaded net to the shore for they were only about 100 yards from the shore. This is just like Peter, isn't it? He doesn't wanna wait the 100 yards but he wants to jump in the water and do all the work himself. When they got there, they found breakfast waiting for them. There was fish cooking over a charcoal fire and some bread. Bring some of the fish that you've caught, said Jesus. So Simon Peter went aboard, Simon again, and he dragged the net to the shore. There were 153 large fish, and yet the net hadn't torn. Yet they'd been out all night and not caught anything. But when we step into the assignment and the plan that God has for us, we seem to prosper much more easily. Now, come and have some breakfast, Jesus said. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Then Jesus served them the bread and the fish, and this was the third time that Jesus had appeared to his disciples since he'd been raised from the dead. Now this is the dialogue that I want us to look at this morning. After breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, Peter replied. You know that I love you. Then feed my lambs, Jesus told him. Jesus repeated the question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said, you know that I love you. Then take care of my sheep. Jesus said a third time, he asked him, and Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt that Jesus asked him this question three times. He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said, then feed my sheep. There are three parts of this story that I want to bring out today. There is a question, there is an answer, and at the end of all that dialogue, there is a new assignment given. Is Jesus insecure? I, I was just wondering this. Is Jesus that insecure that he has to ask, do you love me? I don't know about you, but in your relationships, do you have to ask someone, do, do you love me? Do you really love me? You know, Valentine's Day is coming up pretty soon. 
And there are many of us that are expecting gifts, maybe chocolates or roses and stuff like that, as a token of love, to show us that those close to us love us and care for us. But I don't think that Jesus is insecure at this part. I don't think Jesus is asking this question because he's insecure, but he's wanting to draw something out of Peter. You see, the backdrop of this story is these disciples and Peter, they have just spent three years with Jesus. They became his disciples and they traveled with him and they saw amazing, miraculous events. They heard his teaching. They heard his preaching. They saw the blind see. They, heard, they saw the deaf hear again. They, they saw the lame get up and walk. They saw everything that seemed to be impossible and they believed that he was the Messiah. They believed that he was the Lord. They believed that he was God incarnate. They really, truly believed and they followed him. They followed him with all their hearts. And then everything changed. Then there was the arrest. And then there was the cross. And then there was a devastating death. Now, they, these are just, these men are human beings. They witnessed such things that, that would change your life, that would, would, would give you trauma, that would give you stress. They saw the whippings. They saw the beatings. They saw this man that they thought was almighty God. And they saw him die. They were confused. They were not sure of anything anymore. They were in that place where everything that they held on to, everything that they believed was suddenly not sure. And then he had told them this, that he would die. He had told them that he would rise again. And then he did. He rose again. But can you just go with me a moment? We read it so flippantly off the pages of the Bible. But just imagine that you are in an upper room hiding and fearing for your life and wondering what on earth has gone on with your Lord that he's now dead. And then the next minute he appears in the room. He's walked through the door. He's walked through the walls. He's just appeared like magic because he's God. You can see the scars on his hands. You can see the scars on his face. Feet. You can see the scar in his side where he was pierced and yet he's real, he's talking, he's eating, he's with you in the flesh again. This has got to stress you out a little bit. This has got to confuse you a little bit. This goes beyond all the parameters of what we know in this world as normal. So if I was to pack all that up together and then I'm looking at this story right now they are on the in-between season have you ever been in an in-between season you see Jesus has risen from the dead hallelujah but he's not yet ascended to heaven the Holy Spirit has not been given his commission to them they're in that in-between they they don't really know what's going to happen next they're still unsure they're still a little bit unsafe being in an in-between place in our lives, we become vulnerable. I can only liken it to when you go to the circus and you watch the trapeze artist swimming from one to the other swing and there's that moment in time where they let go of the swing in midair and they are not holding on to anything and that's how it feels like when we are in the in-between season of our lives. We're not holding on to anything but Almighty God is holding on to us. But they can't feel that. And there are times in our lives when we can't feel that. And we would question, do you, do you love me, Lord? Are, are you really there? Are you really real? Is this Bible that I'm believing in, is it true in my times of need, in my times of in-between? They are alone. They are unsure. They are not safe. It's an unknown place and they are uncertain of what's happening next. And so when we face a trauma, when we face a crisis, when we face any loss or, or fearful time, what we wanna do is grasp on and hold on to what is familiar to us, to things that we know. We might wanna be around friends or family. We wanna do the same things that give us comfort, the things that we know that are predictable, the things that we know are good. And so here is Peter. He's in this trauma, this crisis part of his life. And he thinks, I need to do something that I used to do. I need to go back to fishing because that's what I know that I'm good at. That's what I'm familiar with. I need to do something though I feel safe. But Peter has been anointed as a leader. And so when Peter declares, I'm going fishing, everyone follows. 
You've got to be really careful who you listen to. You've got to be really careful who you follow after. You've got to be really careful who you copy. And he does become a good leader. But right now, Peter is in this traumatic place and he wants to run away. He wants to go back to what is predictable. He wants to cling to what he knew, to what he knows best. He doesn't like being out of his comfort zone. And so he goes fishing and he leads others with him. They've been fishing all night in this story. They've been trying to do things with their own way, not God's way. They did it before. This was their business. This was their career. They were expert fishermen. They knew what to do. They knew the seas. They knew the equipment. And yet they came out with nothing. You see, when we step into that place of familiarity, we might have been really good at it before. We might have been known how to do it before. But if God had called you out of that place into his purpose, if you step back, your hands are going to be empty. It's going to be unfruitful. It's not going to work the same as it used to work. And so they've been out all night long. And I love the fact that Jesus is kicking the shells on the beach. And I think he's like a parent that's waiting for his kids to come home. And what made me think this is because when he shouts out, fellows, did you catch anything? He knows jolly well they didn't catch a bean. It doesn't actually say fellows. If you go back to the Greek, it says children. In other words, you didn't listen to me. You're not grown up enough. You're not mature enough. You've gone out and tried to do it in your own strength. Have you caught anything, kids? Because I'm just on this beach waiting for you to come back to the place where you need to come, waiting for you to come back to me because I've already got fish here. I've already cooking what you need. I'm already providing for your needs. No, we, we, we didn't catch anything. Okay, throw your nets on the right side. It doesn't say left side because it needed to be right side to emphasize there's a right side and the wrong side. Throw your nets on the right side and they obey. They're not too sure who this guy is at the moment, but they obey. And then the result is they draw in 153 fat fish. It even tells us the number. Come, come and eat breakfast. There's many times that Jesus invites us to come to him. He says, come and see. Come and learn. Come and know me. Come and eat if you are hungry. Come and drink if you are thirsty. And even today, Jesus still sends out those invitations to come to him. And so they approach the fire, they approach the breakfast, and then as they sit down around him, they've realized by this time that this is the Lord, that this is Jesus come back to see them one more time. And as they sit there, I think it would have been a lovely place on a beach with the fire crackling, the fish cooking, the warm bread. Jesus hands it out to them. And he even set, makes them feel better by saying, oh, you can add some of your fish if you like. I don't need your fish, but you can add them if you want to. And then there's a quietness in the conversation. And he turns to Peter. And we've just read about Peter. And he says, do you love me? He looks him in the eye, face to face, and he's talking only to Peter right now because Peter is the leader. Peter is the key. Peter is the one that he's, he's concerned with right now. And he says, do you love me? But I've, I've not got it right there. If you actually read it back, please keep your Bibles open and check that I'm saying the right thing because it doesn't just say, do you love me? It says, do you love me more than these? And scholars often commentate whether he's talking about the disciples around him or whether it's about the, the fishing equipment or the fish themselves. But actually Jesus is saying, Simon, he calls him Simon sometimes and Peter sometimes because Peter is the name that he's got to walk into. Peter is the rock on which Jesus is going to build his church. But he keeps slipping back into his old ways, his old name, Simon. Simon, do you love me more than you love your career, more than you love doing what you're doing, the fishing, 
because I called you out of that. And now I see you've gone back to that. Do you love me more than your business? More than your friends and your position and your power? Oh, that's a real question. I don't know whether Peter could really answer it truthfully at that stage. Because Peter, I want to ask you another question. Why are you here? What are you doing here on this beach in Galilee, getting out of a fishing boat when I called you to fish for men, to fish for women, to fish for people, and yet you are fishing and I find you here. What are you doing here if you love me, Peter? Sometimes in our lives, we find ourselves in the wrong places at the wrong times, doing the wrong stuff with the wrong people. And I would imagine the Holy Spirit tapping us on the shoulder and saying, what are you doing here? Today would be a, a good time to examine ourselves and just check, are we in the right place at the right times with the right people doing what God has assigned us to do? You see, Peter had a fishing rod in his hand and he was out fishing when he should have had the word of God in his hand and he should have been fishing for people. Today, I want to ask you a question. What are you holding on to? Peter was holding on to what he knew in the past, his fishing rod, his fishing career. That was his source, that was his income, that's what he ran to. Instead, he should have been holding on to the word of God and running to Jesus, who is his source, his strength, his provider. And he does manage to answer and he says, yes, Lord, you know I love you. I just wonder, could he really, really eat that breakfast at that moment? Because the, if, if I was sat there and Jesus' eyes were staring at mine, I don't think I would have the right state of mind or stomach to eat the food. I would be so nervous and so anxious. What? No, not in the presence of God. I'm, I'm not eating this breakfast right now. He can feel this tension in the question. And he answers, yes, you know I love you. And as he's looking at the fire, the Bible tells us that the fire is actually made of charcoal. There was another fire in the Bible that was made of charcoal. And that is the fire that was in the court of the high priest. Peter's mind must have surely gone back to that night of the Last Supper when again there was a meal before them, again Jesus had invited them to, to eat and had provided everything for them and they were discussing stuff and, and, Peter, and, and Jesus was trying to say, I'm going to die and I'm going to rise again. And Peter was saying, no, that can't be so. But then, 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 then he comes out with this, if, even if everyone else deserts you, I will never desert you, Jesus. And Jesus replies, I tell you the truth, Peter, this very night, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. No, Peter insists. Even if I have to die with you, Jesus, I will never, ever, ever deny you. And all the other disciples, they, they follow as well, saying the same thing because they followed the leader. But we know the story too well. Even though that Peter had pledged his, his faithfulness, his undying love, that he would, he would never ever deny his saviour, that he would never leave his saviour, that he would even die for him, the opportunity came that very night. Jesus was arrested and fear hit Peter's life. As he watched the way that Jesus was treated, he didn't want to go through that same experience. He realized that his love had been fickle. It hadn't been the same type of love that Jesus had towards him. Yeah, Jesus could die for him, but he's not ready to die for Jesus. And as he's warm in his hands in the courtyard of the high priest over a charcoal fire, a girl recognizes him. Oh, you look familiar. Aren't you with that? No, no. I don't even know the man. And he denies knowing Jesus. Later on, someone comes to him and says, um, you've got an accent. Are you, are you not with that Galilean? No, no. And he starts to swear. He even starts to act like he's not a Christian, that he's never known Jesus. He starts to swear. And three times he denies his Lord. And almost immediately after the third denial, he hears the rooster crow. I can just imagine. 
as he realized the enormity of his failure, that he has failed to be faithful to the one who's always faithful, who will never leave us, never let us down, no matter what we do or wherever we go. He is faithful and steadfast. And yet Peter has denied him. The tears flow and there begins the anxiety. There begins the fear. There begins the condemnation. There begins all the failure upon his life. And from that moment on, as he walks through life, whatever he does is carrying that sense of guilt and shame that he has messed up so badly that no one can put it right. Have you ever done that? Have you ever messed up so badly that no one can put it right? Maybe you're watching online or you're in this place today and you've got that sort of limp with your life, that heaviness, because every now and then the shame hits you and it stings you and you wish you could roll it back what you said or roll it back what you did. Or There are so many times the guilt is heavy and now he's sat having breakfast over another coal fire and he's face to face with Jesus. And Jesus hasn't got him in that position to bring shame upon him or to rub salt in any wound. He says, now, Peter, we are gonna face this head on. We are gonna take this thing, that shadow over your life, and we're putting it on the table and we are gonna talk about it. We are gonna walk through it because I am the almighty counsellor. I am the omniscient one. I am here to heal. I am here to restore. I'm here to restore your broken heart, your brokenness, your broken ways and our broken relationship. Jesus wasn't broken on any part, but sometimes we do stuff and we step away. We don't wanna be face to face with Jesus. We don't wanna pray we don't want to read our Bible. We don't want to go to church. We don't want to mix with Christians because the shame separates us. But Jesus comes looking. He comes searching and he comes finding and he wants to put it on the table. He wants to open it up and put a light upon it just for a moment, not to shame you. Search me, oh God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is anything offensive in me and lead me into the way everlasting. And the only way he can do this is to open it up with his light. He takes us to the fireplace. He takes us to the fire. And what we do, we, we, we carry our burnt offering and the only burnt offering that Peter's got right now, the only burnt offering that's any good for this fire right now is my sin, my mess, my mistake. And when we take it to the fire of God, he purges us clean because he burns up that stuff as if it never happened. And forgiveness flows and freedom flows. All that pain on the altar, on the fire, all that shame goes on the altar, goes on that charcoal fire. And as he does, he starts to feel a lightness again. He feels clean, he feels forgiven, he feels washed. Because the altar is there to alter us. To take us from a place of condemnation to a place of freedom. There are sometimes stuff that we've done in our past and we've taken it to the Lord and he's forgiven us and cleansed us and there might have been consequences to pay, but when we are free, we are free indeed. I've got to tell you today, whatever is over your life, whatever shadow is over your life, take it to that fire, that altar place of God and let him take care of it because you were never intended to carry the heaviness of sin. You know, my little grandson came to me one day and he had a splinter in his finger and it hurt. And so I've got my tweezers out and I needed to get my little scissors out just to help it. And he ran away. 
But then he ran away and he was still in pain and he was holding it and it was hurting him. And he didn't understand that sometimes you have to go through a tiny little bit of pain to have relief. And this is what Jesus was doing with Peter that day. He was saying, come on, that stuff that's deep in you, deep in your soul, that pain, that stuff that haunts you, get it on the table because when, when I cut it out, it is gone and it has no hold on you ever again unless you want to take it back. He is the lifter of our head. I think that Peter up to this point was walking around with his head in shame. Yeah, he might have had pockets of good times, pockets of joy, but generally because of what he'd messed up with, he was carrying this pain and this shame and his, his head was downcast. And Jesus comes along for you and for me and he is the one that lifts up our head so that we can walk free again because he heals us, he restores us and he forgives us and he has grace and compassion on our lives. So he's asked him a question. Peter's given an answer. And because of the answer that he gave, he said, yes, Lord, I do love you. He's given an assignment. Okay, feed my sheep. It's the assignment I originally gave you. I've not taken it away, but go feed my sheep. Jesus deals with his denials three times and three times he forgives him. But the word love, when I looked at love, the English word for love is just one word. You know, I can say that I love my husband and I love my shoes and I love ice cream all in the same breath. And it seems like it's the same meaning. It doesn't really tell you the depth of how I love ice cream compared to the depth of how I love my husband. And yet, if we look at the Greek, they have many words for the different levels of love. So in Greek, this, that this is talking about is two words, agape and filio love. And the reason I'm telling you this is because when Jesus asks Peter, do you love me? He's saying, do you agape me, Peter? And agape is sacrificial love. It's, it's a greater love. It's a, a committed love. It's steadfast. It never leaves. It is consistent. It endures. It perseveres. And agape love even loves the unlovable. It's a love from God. But Peter's response is a different love. He said, yes, Lord, you know that I filio you, which means you're my mate, you're my friend, bro. In fact, that's why Philadelphia in America is called Philadelphia. It's called the city of brotherly love. And so two times Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? Do you agape me? Do you sacrifice, will you sacrifice your life for me? And twice Peter says, no, I can't do that, but I can be your friend. I can be your mate. I tried that before and I failed miserably. And the third time, Jesus comes down to Peter's level and he says, okay, let's be on the same plane here. Do you, filio, love me? Peter says, yeah, I can do that. I can start there. I can start loving you as a friend. And then when I looked at the Spanish, Jesus says, mi amas, which is the same sort of agape, sacrificial love. But Peter replies, te quiero, which is, means I want to. In other words, Jesus is saying, I can't agape you yet. I can't sacrificially love you yet, but I can try a little bit. I want to, I want to. And Jesus says, that's enough for me. Peter is saying, I, I can't lay my life down for you, Lord. I tried it, but I do want to. And yet Jesus accepts this type of love. Even though he continues to offer his sacrificial love, even though this love that he's receiving off Peter and receives off us is a lot less. It's like when Jesus takes the bread 
the two loaves of bread and three fish, whatever it is, and he multiplies it and feeds the 5,000. When we come to Jesus with our little tiny bit of love, he then takes it and he receives it gladly and he multiplies it and he grows it and he takes us through life with him and we start to grow in him and we start to increase in our love for him and we start by little baby steps, step at a time until we go from glory to glory to glory. And when Peter gave him his, 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 his tiny little bit of love that he couldn't trust Jesus in yet, I'll just give you this little bit, then he takes it off Peter. And what does he do with Peter's life? We know he takes it from glory to glory to glory. He takes it from running away fishing to then at the end of Peter's life, 35 years later, he lays his life down for Jesus. You see, we think we've got to catch fish cleaned up. In other words, when we want people to know Jesus, we expect them to be saved already. We want them to know everything already. We want them to dress the proper way, speak the proper way. But they're dirty fish. And they stay dirty for a little while, I'm afraid. It takes time for them to grow. But even ourselves, as we start our encounter with Jesus, as we start our relationship with Jesus, it starts with little steps. <laughs> Don't trust you yet, but I'm just gonna sit here a little while and listen. I'm just gonna pop in that church now and then. I'm just gonna watch it online now and then, but I, I'm not a Christian. I'm not gonna start reading my Bible. And then slowly, with the love of Jesus, he starts to draw us in. We test him with a little prayer and he starts to answer it. So we test him a little bit more and we grow in confidence. We grow in faith. You might be in this place today and you might think, yeah, I, I, I can't believe in this Jesus. That's okay. That's okay. He accepts you the way you are. You just keep coming to church. You just keep listening to the messages. You just let people pray for you and Jesus will bring you to that place. You know, I, I, can't, I can't lead a connect group. That's okay. Why don't you just go to one? Why don't you just join one? You know, I, I heard that offering, but I, I'm not giving Jesus my money yet. That's okay. You start with little baby steps. Don't start with 10%. Start with 2%. It doesn't matter. Start. In fact, God says, test me in this. And he increases our confidence in him. I, I can't forgive. You don't know what people have done to me. That's okay. Let Jesus forgive you for what you've done. That's your starting place. Well, I can't, I can't sing and like the worship team. That's okay. Stand on the door and say hi to people and welcome them. Even if you can't say, and they just smile. I can't preach. Well, why don't you try it out in kids' church? You know, I was in kids' church for the first 10 years of my Christian walk and I learned the best sermons in there. What I'm trying to show us, folks, is there's a starting place, but we need to start. I wonder if the band would come back right now. And for Peter, he knew he had this call on his life. He knew he had this assignment, but it was too big a thing to jump into. So Jesus takes him through this dialogue for three steps. He says, start with feeding my lambs. In other words, start looking at the kids in kids' church. Start teaching them. And then he says, number two, start caring for my sheep. And then number three, when you've learned to care for my sheep, then you can preach to them. Once you love them a little bit and learn to love them, then you can start to teach them. You see, Jesus wants to take our little and he will breathe on it with the Holy Spirit. He wants to take the little bit of interest we've got in him. He wants to take the little bit of love or trust or faith we've got in him and it's like a seed that he plants deep and he is the one that waters it. He is the one that cultivates it. He is the one that causes it to grow. It's not anything of us. Otherwise, it is worthless. And by the way, he's talking to Peter and he says, I just need to remind you, Peter, remind you of the day I called you 
And as Peter starts to look back, he's just come off this boat and they've been out fishing all night and they never caught a bean. And then Jesus came along and told them to fish the other side. And he remembers three years ago when it happened to him the first time. God repeated the very same miracle is when Peter first got called. It was a night just the same. He'd been out fishing, never caught a bean. And then there was Jesus coming along the shore, told them where to fish. And then they got this great big haul of fish. And then Jesus points at Peter and says, now I will make you fisher of people. What I called you to do way back then, I haven't taken it away. It's still what I'm calling you to do today. You might not have stepped into it. You might have got discouraged along the way. You might have tripped up along the way. You might have even been disqualified along the way. But that assignment is still yours. That assignment is still for you to do today. I'm just gonna ask you to think for a moment. Would you bring it to the altar today? Would you bring that failure to the feet of Jesus? Because you can't carry that anymore. You messed up, but it shouldn't haunt you for the rest of your life. You failed, but Jesus wants to pick you back up and dust you down and put you back on your feet and send you off again as if it never happened. I wonder today if there's stuff that you need to have burnt away out of your life on the altar of God. Bring your fear, bring your failure, bring your mess. And there's only one place that you can bring that stuff to. There's only one person that can deal with that stuff. And that is Jesus. Because he died on the cross to take away all our sin, all our shame, all our fear, all our failure. You know, today in this place, maybe you need to be reconnected to what God called you to do. Maybe you need to be reinstated. Maybe you need to be recalled. Maybe you need to be restored back to God's assignment. But you've got to start right where you're at. And what Jesus is looking for today is a simple yes. A simple willingness to start. I wonder if you're watching online or you're in this place today and you've never put your trust in Jesus as your Lord and Saviour. You've heard stories about him changing and transforming people's lives. You, you've heard a lot about him, but it's just not for you. But maybe in this place today, maybe in this place today, you want to say, just start with a little, okay, maybe, yes. If that's you, I'm just going to pray a prayer. You don't have to say it out loud. Say it in your heart. Say it in your head. Dear Lord Jesus, I, I have messed up. I failed. I'm struggling. I don't understand anything about the Bible. I don't understand anything about you. But Lord, I've tried and I've gone everywhere for help. And I'm coming to you today. I'm bringing my little to you today. I'm asking you to get involved in my life today. I'm asking you to transform my mind. I'm asking you to get involved in my, my stuff. I'm asking you, Lord, to start letting me learn how to love you. I'm asking you, Lord, to let me feel and experience your love for me. I'm sorry for all I've done. And I want to start again. I want to come to the altar. And I want to lay this stuff down. And I want to give it to you. And I want to walk out this place with it not in my hands anymore. With it not in my head anymore. Not in my heart anymore. Lord, because it's crippling my life. So I'm just going to dump it at this altar today in this church. And if you resonate with anything like that. The Holy Spirit knows exactly where you are. And he has come to heal, to restore, and to set you on a new path. 
a new beginning, with a new hope, with a new sense of freedom. He's come to set you on God's assignment for your life. In Jesus' name, amen.